you very much indeed. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today and um, an, a real delight to see uh, some people who I, I've known for a short time, colleagues working in this particular role, but also someone I've known for a very long time indeed, which is Jenny Carpenter, who I think I first met in about 1987. <laughs> Um, around ecumenical working um, locally and nationally. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here, uh, particularly in your presence, Jenny, for a person from whom I have learned so much. So I'm going to talk about three things. Why, how, and who. So, but first of all, I'm going to tell you who I am. Who is this random woman? So I'm Flora Winfield, and I'm the third Church Estates Commissioner. So um, there are three Church Estates Commissioners, you won't be surprised to hear, and we are the people who are responsible, uh, together with the, the Board of Trustees, the Church Commissioners, um, for the oversight of the Church of England's historic assets and for various aspects of that work. So the first Church Estates Commissioner does the money, that's Alan Smith. Uh, the second Church of States Commissioner is Andrew Salou, who represents us in Parliament, so he does politics. Alan says that he's Mammon, and Alan is Caesar. So Alan then says, that makes you God, Flora, <laughs> because I do everything else. <clears throat> so I'm responsible for the committees that look after bishoprics and cathedrals, so sea houses, which are a a very big opportunity, we always like to see in that light rather than a challenge, big opportunity to respond to carbon net zero, partly because they're mostly big emitters, but also because they're big exemplars. So if we can make our sea houses excellent examples of carbon net zero, that's a marvellous opportunity for us in our public ministry to share that with our friends and colleagues. So the Mission and Pastoral and Church Property Committee, which has some responsibility with church buildings, but mostly is involved in pastoral reorganisation. And I chair the Carbon Net Zero Programme Board, which I guess is why they've invited me to be with you today. I came to this work by a slightly strange route in that I've spent most of the last 20 years as a humanitarian diplomat. So I was the Church of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Anglican Communion's permanent representative at the United Nations and at the Commonwealth. And before that, I was the Anglican Communion Relations Secretary at Lambeth Palace. So I spent a lot of time working with our colleagues around the Communion on humanitarian response, on relief, on development and on advocacy. So I've had the opportunity, the extraordinary privilege of seeing for myself those things which Jo was so touchingly describing in her presentation, the direct effects of the climate emergency on those who have least responsibility for it. And I'm going to end with an image from that experience. But I have seen the human consequences of drought, of floods, of the extraordinary knock-on for food security, for human security capacity for conflict generation, which rests in the struggle for resources. So for me, this is a really personal business. It's not something which is abstract, although I think the data and analytics is hugely significant, and in this is our friend. But it's also about that personal commitment, that engagement, that understanding of how this is affecting those who are just like us living and working in their Anglican parish, in Malawi, in Kenya, in the DRC, in South Sudan, in the islands of the Pacific, in the far north of Canada. We are brothers and sisters everywhere in this shared faith and this shared commitment to our care for creation as a fundamental aspect of our understanding of the call to us of the gospel. So that's a bit of the why for me. Each of us has our own why. Everybody will have that particular thing that sparked in them this passionate concern. And it's one of the things that keeps giving us energy, which is important because this is not easy. It's not straightforward. And I do think one of the things that's most significant and lovely about the life we have together in the Christian church is our capacity not to be afraid of complexity. To understand that we can handle stuff which is difficult and complicated and conflicted and doesn't have instant easy solutions, but we've got between us the wit and the inspiration and the spirit, literally and metaphorically, 
to understand and make sense of it, to be friends with the data and analytics and the technical solutions, and to put behind us fear and anxiety around these questions. So I live in rural North Yorkshire in a village called Thornton Watless, which is just outside Beedale, which is just outside North Allerton. I'm married to an archdeacon, so I live every day in my life, in my village, in our deanery, in our diocese. The, the, the everyday realities of just how difficult it is to be in a local church. How tough it is, how hard it is to make things happen. So I don't underestimate the challenges involved. But we have made a significant commitment to enable us to overcome these challenges. We have made an investment, an investment which is partly financial, but also in people, to enable us to take these challenges seriously and not to find them a source of anxiety and fear, but to know that together we can do this. We just need to take the first step. For me, in the life of those rural churches that surround my own particular situation, living in a vicarage in rural North Yorkshire, in most of those churches, responding to the climate emergency will be about doing small things that make a difference, that don't actually represent a massive investment, but actually transform their carbon footprint, which is already quite little. But as well as what we can do to our buildings, this is also for each of us about metanoia. That fundamental transformation, that repentance, that turning to Christ, that change of life, to which each of us is called, as Joe says, as we face the climate emergency together. We need to make that metanoia, that repentance, that transformation individually, as institutions, locally, at diocesan level, nationally, we all need to change how we do stuff. This was brought home to me the other day when I was in a conversation with a group of administrators from cathedrals, one of the areas I'm responsible for. And they were talking about how they can really drill down into their supply chains. How can they ensure that what they're getting into their cathedral refectories or their shops is not coming by some potentially ethically indefensible labour route, which is also an issue, and some very hard to defend climate route to be sold by them to raise money for their cathedral. And if they're using wooden cutlery instead of plastic in their refectory, where is it coming from? And how is it sustainable? There's a real will to tackle these questions. So even though it looks like a huge thing, I honestly think the way we tackle it is by doing the small things that make a difference. Because if we all do the small things, we will together make a big difference. And we will have the opportunity to experience that transformation, which is the result of metanoia, of that change of life, that turning away from sin and to Christ, away from the sin of exploiting our natural environment and towards caring for it for all the powerful reasons which have just been shared with her, for us. So moving on to look at the how, we've made a significant investment in this as an institution, as I say, and you all have heard some of this before, but let me just set it out again so that it's in our minds. I chair the Carbon Net Zero Programme Board and we are trusted with the responsibility for making sure that the Church of England spends £190 million really well over the next nine years. That's our job. We're not the grant-making body. We're the oversight group. So we've just now set up a new grant-making body which will begin its meetings. The first meeting is in February and we have criteria for, for our investment in those uh, climate projects, um, pilots which we'll be looking at in the first tranche. And in the first three years of that nine-year period, so the funding is divided into three triennia. The Church of England loves to work in threes. <laughs> There'll be, the, the expenditure, the funds available, will be about £30 million. And that money will be there to enable us to understand what we need to do, to plan, to pilot, to research, to test. 
So that's the first phase. And I think it's really important that we're doing it like this because it's an urgent problem, but we also need to do it right. We need to use the right technology that's really appropriate. We don't need to over-engineer solutions for very small churches. We need to really understand the problem, and that needs to be based in very, very good research. You're talking about the surveys, which people can do on their buildings, the, the excellent carbon footprint. Um, I don't know how many people have done that, but it's a, it's a very, very good tool to understand your situation well. So in that first triennium, the focus... So 23, 24, 25 will be on building capacity and skills, developing plans and piloting projects, preparing for larger capital programs in the second triennium. So it's about planning carefully through that time because this is a long-term commitment. This is not us going, oh, we're going to do this now and then in three years' time we're going to go off and do something else and we'll think we've done it. We know that this is a long-term commitment and this is a th three sets of three years. But when we get to 2030, we'll still have to then look at the next set of investment and the next set of challenges and the next set of targets that we'll need to set for ourselves and that we'll need to achieve. So how's that money going to work? Well, it's going to be uh, distributed, and in fact, very excitingly, it's, we're already getting applications from dioceses. I can't tell you how excited about this I am about this. It's going to be distributed initially in £15,000 starter grants to dioceses. So dioceses can apply for a £15,000 starter grant to help them develop their plan. This is about how we plan well. So in another part of my life, I've spent 25 years in the Reserve Army, and I know that if you... If you don't plan well, you really won't make it to where you need to get to. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail, we say in the army. So planning, really important. So that £15,000 starter grant is there for all dioceses to apply for. You can apply at any time uh, up to the end of March. And very excitingly, at the beginning of, yes of yesterday, we'd had 19 applications from dioceses for that grant. And by the end of yesterday, we'd had 22. Isn't that great? So dioceses have really got this. They've got, okay, we can access this money. It will help us make our plan. And then step two, using the plans made with that initial starter grant, that little bit of seed corn to help people get going, dioceses will then be able to apply for um, more significant funding which will be about capacity building. So we are encouraging dioceses to come together in little clusters of two or three together to employ specialists who will then be able to support parishes and deaneries and cathedrals and theological education institutions and all our other built environment institutions and communities around the work that they need to do to get to carbon net zero. So this is about how we enable dioceses to have the right people to enable parishes to do what they need to do. And we hope that all dioceses will apply for money for these posts um, because it's a really, uh, capacity building is a really excellent way making sure that we share the expertise and the learning. So what we, what we hope doesn't happen is that people who are already far ahead go zooming into the distance and say, hey, we made it, isn't that great? And then everybody else is left behind. And we particularly don't want to ha that to happen to smaller and less, less well-advantaged dioceses. We, we really need to make sure that this is an equitable process. So those grants will be, will be um, tilted to ensure that diocesan wealth and size is taken into account. But as I say, we're encouraging dioceses to work together in clusters so that we're not having one diocese employing one ex expert. We're having two or three employing several people who can then bring different skill sets and enable parishes across that region and also work with the cathedrals. So there is really sensible, I think, approach which, for which all credit goes to our excellent colleagues in the, in the environment team, um, in the NCIs, um, who have do, been doing fantastic work on this and who brought us the route map and who've been joined as from yesterday by Julian Atkins as the new head of Carbon Net Zero for the Church of England who's come to us um, from Gloucestershire County Council and from the Brecon Beacons National Park. So he brings a really interesting set of experience and very down-to-earth, practical, local solutions to these questions. So that's a little bit about how and those capacity grants 
I think a really important aspect of the how is about exemplars. So one of the plans for the first triennium is to make sure that we start with some very good pilots, places where people can learn. So somebody, you know, we find the resources, we enable a church, a cathedral to do this so that we can all see how it works. And we know that some of those won't work. We know that some of them will not come up with the right solution, but we need to be able to live in an environment where people can try things out and discover and learn. And some of that is already underway, as you've seen from the excellent film. I think the, the work that's been done on heating people, not buildings, is really excellent. And sharing the learning is a very big aspect of that for us as church institutions. But also, for me, this is very significantly about how churches are in leadership in our communities. I know that our local communities are looking to us and saying, you've got the most difficult building in our community, the most intractably not carbon net zero building, the most historic building, the most highly heritage listed building, the most awkward building to do anything with. If you can do this, if you can be the brave people who can show leadership in this, actually we can do it too. And I've seen the respect that's been garnered from colleagues and local authorities around the fact that we've been so determined to take this forward. People have noticed that we're taking the climate emergency seriously. And I honestly think that this is one of our most significant missional tools for the next 10 years. I don't think that's why we should do it. I think we should do it because it's the right thing to do. But it's also a really important aspect. It's a way of proclaiming the gospel that we can share the fact that this matters to us and that we take it seriously. And we're giving it our best shot. I think we've got excellent resources. I'm, I'm lost in admiration for that route map. I can say this because I've not been involved in any of this at all. Um, it's all from before I was uh, involved in this particular area. I think it's the most tremendous tool, a really inspiring and helpful thing, partly because it's realistic and achievable. But I think we now need to look at the route map and our own local situations and say, what are the barriers? What are the things that are, that are holding us back? What are the difficulties for us? And what kind of expert support do we need in order to overcome them? Because that's where we can focus the work in the diocese brought to us through those capacity building posts. So I'm coming to the end, don't worry. So we've looked at why and we looked a bit at how. What about the who? The who, of course, is all of us. This is everybody's business. I had an extraordinary experience um, among many a few years ago when I was uh, visiting colleagues in Pacific. And a lot of the inhabitants of small Pacific islands are Anglican. All the inhabitants of some of the islands are Anglican. They are completely Anglican communities. So they really are us in every way. And I was visiting them because I was doing work on small island states. In my, in my UN representative capacity and looking at the, at the food security issues that have the water security issues, the extraordinary economic disadvantage that they suffer from in many places, very high levels of domestic violence, really high levels of sexual violence, very complex communities. And I was talking to my friend Archbishop Winston Halapua, surely a saint of the Anglican Communion. He is a, a, an islander himself, who became an archbishop in Aotearoa, New Zealand. He is small and dynamic, an unstoppable force of nature, full of passionate commitment to his community. And he said to me, this is not tomorrow's problem. This is today's problem. We are already up to our knees. Our islands are already uninhabitable. The water is already full of salt from the sea. It's already too late for some of our communities, but it's not too late for the world if we know that this is today's problem. We can make a difference, and even in the difficulties of his local situation, he is utterly committed to enabling all of us to understand why this matters so much to undertake that journey of metanoia, of transformation, to be brave and bold in facing co complex questions, and to know that this is not tomorrow's problem, it's today's. And it's everybody's business. <laughs>